Okay, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure other people will be trickling in. Um, we have a lot, a lot of material to cover, so uh, try to give the panelists as much time as possible um, to talk about these really remarkable papers. So I'm Lee Raymond. I'm a professor of political science at Purdue University, although at the moment I'm actually out on the West Coast on my sabbatical. So um, it's earlier in the morning out here, but uh, really looking forward to moderating today's panel on the topic of energy security and electric policy, electricity policy, um, which is a part as I think, as most of you know, of the great 2020, 2021 North American Colloquium on Climate Policy um, organized, uh, or, or I think led by Barry Ray, who's here, right? And I think Josh also, right? Pesetius, who also has played a really key role in that. Um, and that colloquium is really a collaborative venture between Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy, and specifically, I guess, it's International Policy Center and the University of Toronto and the Autonomous National University of Mexico. Um, uh, created a few years ago, the colloquium has brought together really um, highly talented leading academic analysts and practitioners right from all three countries to address um, key public policy issues facing those countries. And last year's issue was climate change, um, which is how people like me ended up being a part of the process. So, uh, so these events, uh, and the reports that are being generated uh, for climate have also been supported by the, the Meany Family Foundation as well. So um, Josh and Barry wanted me to mention that. So today we'll focus on three of the reports coming out of this effort. Um, the first is by Monica Gattinger from the University of Ottawa, uh, Canada, US Relations, Energy, Security, and the Road to Net Zero by 2050. Uh, the second by Marcela Lopez Vallejo uh, from the University of Guadalajara um, is on Mexico US cross border electricity hubs, uh, limitations and opportunities for decarbonization. And then the third speaker will be Josh or Joshua Sechis from University of Michigan, uh, presenting work that I think is co authored by, I'm going to get this name wrong, Wamaka, I think, Akenzi from the European. Uh, University Institute on the US-Canada clean electricity relationship, challenges and opportunities for policy design and coordination. And Josh wanted me to mention as well that um, as a special bonus gift for attending the seminar, uh, everyone here will receive copies of these reports when they're released in their final published version uh, in a couple of weeks, and those will be emailed to you as well. So um, if there's something that you feel like you wanted to hear more about and you didn't get a chance to have a question answered, you'll have a chance to see the full reports, right? And I, having read all of these now several times, multiple times, I recommend them all very highly, so. Okay, um, so Josh and Barry asked me to just mention a few things that really stood out to me from, from reading these three papers together pretty carefully now. I've read, I think I've now read all of them at least twice. Um, they're really remarkably good papers and they're really remarkable. I, was, I would say that they, it's, rem, it's remarkable to me I, that how little this issue gets attention um, and, and how important it really is, right? So I think this is a, a great opportunity to look at this sort of cross-border coordination question, right? Around, um, in particular, the issue of electricity and renewables for electricity. Um, and that, and that, that these three authors have done a remarkable job of digging into some of the pretty technical details of that, making that really accessible. Um, I, I would say a few things that just really stood out to me as themes across the three papers. Um, the first was, I, I guess, really reinforcing yet again, you know, as somebody who's been studying energy and climate policy now for 20 years, how utterly transformed this topic has been by the shale oil revolution in the US, like just absolutely has turned things that we thought we knew 100% in 2000 on their head, basically, right? Um, and that, that revolution, I think, really reverberates through all of these papers as they discuss these cross-border issues. Um, I, I think they also speak to an, an important topic that perhaps doesn't always get as much attention as it should, and even maybe in some cases gets a little bit politicized. And I think Monica and I talked about this a little bit, at least by email. And that is really the issue of kind of energy security and reliability as a part of this shift to renewables and, and the importance of cross-border trade in ensuring that kind of security of supply. Uh, and then finally, I was really struck, and this is partly because of my own interests, um, 
at the tensions between sort of what I would describe as local or even maybe national climate and other goals compared to international right, goals and priorities around climate change. Um, I think in different ways, each of the authors and their papers uh, really, really notes that tension as being uh, a serious challenge, right, for perhaps improved coordination, right, of electricity delivery um, between the two countries. And, and again, I think that's something when we get into the q and I have a couple of questions that I might want to ask the panelists about that as well. But um, so, yeah, so with that, I, I'll keep it brief and let's get a go ahead and let the uh, let the panelists, I think, each give about a five minute sort of summary of their main findings and conclusions. And then we'll, right, Josh, and then we'll go ahead and start with the Q&A. Yep. So, okay. And uh, I'm not sure who's going to go first. Is that going to be Monica, Josh? Yep. Okay, great. So Monica, over to you. Uh, great. Thanks, Lee. And, and thank you so much to Josh and to Barry uh, for all the work that has gone into shepherding and, and spearheading uh, this project. It's um, you know, North America in some respects has sort of fallen off uh, political and policy agendas over the last number of years, or at least the good parts of it have fallen off of political and policy agendas. And it's it's really wonderful to see uh, to see it coming back on and to see um, academic institutes uh, take a, a leadership position on this. So thank you again to, to Barry and to Josh. Um, so I'll keep this really brief. I guess the, the first thing I, I just want to say is, you know, why did I write this paper, Lee gave you a bit of a sense of, of the paper. And what I really wanted to try to do was to draw attention to the importance of uh, energy security uh, on the road to net zero. And by that, I mean, often when, you know, when people hear energy security, they think security of oil and gas supplies. And, and you know, yes, that's part of it, but that's not actually, uh, you know, it's a very narrow uh, definition of things. The definition that I take in the paper comes from the International Energy Agency which is ensuring the uninter uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. So it's about, you know, reliability and availability of energy, whether that is oil and gas or power, uh, energy sources, again, that's all sources of uh, energy, all forms of energy, not just some, uh, and it's about affordability. And I think, you know, what, what I have tried to, to articulate in this paper is the way in which um, energy security and ensuring that we've got reliable, affordable supplies of energy on the road to net zero is going to be absolutely crucial in terms of sustaining political support uh, for emissions reductions uh, and in terms of, you know, realizing the economic potential uh, from an industry and investor uh, perspective of, uh, of emissions reductions. Um, the other thing that I do in this paper, so I kind of start by, okay, here's the definition, and then I run through how might, you know, the journey to net zero by 2050 affect availability and, and reliability and affordability, uh, utilizing the uh, IEA's net zero by 2050 roadmap for the uh, global energy sector. So I kind of run through some of, uh, some of that, and I won't go through that here today, but I would uh, encourage you to have a read of the paper if you're interested. And then I spend in the paper um, some time going through, well, why do we see energy security defined in the way I've just to find it, um, falling off the Canada-US uh, energy uh, relationship agenda. And it really is striking to me as somebody who's been looking and you know a student of Canada-US energy relations for a couple of decades now, it's very striking to me that if you look back to say, you know, the year 2000, essentially over the last uh, 20 plus years, you see energy security um, increasingly slide off that bilateral energy agenda. And I articulate in the paper why that is the case, uh, pointing to two things, one of which that Lee already pointed to, which is the shale revolution, which you know, completely upended uh, the United States uh, energy, uh, oil and gas security of supply uh, situation and, and concerns over energy uh, security, um, but also the rise of climate imperatives, which have you know, really zeroed in attention on rightly uh, on emissions reduction. Um, but, you know, I make the case in the paper that, that you know, in the absence of uh, attention to affordability and reliability of energy going forward, uh, that uh, that actually might be counterproductive uh, to achieving emissions reductions, um, emissions reductions objectives. 
Um, so where the paper, you know, kind of ends is looking at, well, where are there some opportunities for Canada and the U.S. to collaborate around, uh, around energy security? And, you know, here I use the uh, partnership for uh, roadmap for a renewed partnership between Canada and the United States as the jumping off point, a document which, you know, again, I was a little disappointed to see did not pay much if any attention to to energy security and i articulate you know in the paper ways in which canada and the us could um, expand that collaboration uh, agenda to include questions of energy uh, security so looking at things like uh, collaboration on on planning and energy forecasting in both uh, countries, coordinating infrastructure planning and builds, notably cross-border. And Lee, I know you want to get into that in, in our discussion. There's lots of opportunities for collaboration around innovation and trade. And again, with a view to both emissions reductions and energy security uh, imperatives, uh, as well as regulatory reform. This is an area that uh, I'm particularly alive to and be happy to get into in the discussion session. Um, so well, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, Lee. I think the only, you know, final thing I would say is that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has really brought a renewed focus to energy security, but understood in that security of oil and gas uh, supplies um, perspective. And I think, you know, to the politics of energy security and the way that concept can be politicized for a variety of different ends. Uh, I think we're really seeing that play out uh, live uh, when it comes to where Europe may or may not go in its future uh, for natural gas and oil, uh, uh, reducing imports from Russia, uh, importing from other countries, you know, backing oil and gas out of their energy supply mix. So I'll stop there, Lee, and hopefully that we can get into a little bit of a discussion of that in. Uh, the Q&A portion. Great, thanks Monica. Um, okay, so uh, well, I think we'll go ahead and just go in the order of the, of the program as is, is typical. So Marcella, if you're willing to go ahead and give us your summary of your main findings in the paper, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks to Josh Basich and Barry Ray for the invitation. Lee, thank you very much for the, for the, 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 the comments for, of today's session. And of course, thank you to the Ford School at the University of Mich Michigan. Um, and of course, the audience connected here this morning. Um, okay, so my paper is, um, it draws attention on the US-Mexico relation uh, in terms of how uh, renewables are treated in the cross-border trade. Because as Monica says, uh, it has been um, not, people have not paid a lot of attention to to electricity trade in the Mexico US border in contrast with the Canada US border. Um, so uh, the, um, the, the problem that, that I identify is that uh, Mexico and US cross border trade is dependent and all the integration and infrastructure, et cetera, goes to the oil and gas sector. The integration is profound in fossil fuels. And uh, in terms of volume, we have a very little electricity exchange and then of that little volume, we have less, less volume of renewables exchange. So, um, but there's a puzzling reality because uh, both uh, sides of the border, uh, states both sides of the border, have their own decarbon decarbonization goals, deploy their own renewables, but they just don't put it into a trade. They just don't have incentives to do that. So the question is, well, why does it happen? Does this happen, right? Why, how do we address this contradiction between domestic state policy goals, looking forward a decarbon decarbonization path versus um, the reality of the energy mix and the energy trade? So um, in the paper, I explain this, uh, this puzzle in three, uh, by, by three factors um, that, that, I, that I identified. Maybe there are some others, but I just focused on, well, I speak from the Mexican side in general. So um, Mexico has a historical dependence on fossil fuels coming uh, from Texas or through or passing through Texas. Almost 70, 70 75% of our gas in Mexico is from the, from the United States. So whenever you in Texas have a freeze like last year's in February, we, Mexico shuts down. We, we don't, you know, we don't have any other source 
of, uh, of powering uh, the country. The second factor is that uh, is how uh, norms uh, up, um, put obstacles or limitations to the, the management of electricity in Mexico. In contrast with the United States, where states have uh, their own policies towards energy or climate uh, or decarbonization goals, Mexico uh, um, centralizes energy. So states have little say in terms of, the, we can develop you know, energy policies, energy uh, climate policies. However, uh, when, when there, there comes regulations or, or, or when there comes uh, you know, the time for implementation, we depend on central uh, decision-making. So um, we, states have little capacity uh, apart from uh, distributed generation or self-consumption states do really do not own their own energy resources. So they cannot um, develop their, their own or independent uh, energy policies. Uh, and the other factor, as I mentioned, is uh, besides a small electricity, uh, having a small electricity market, the infrastructure in the cross-border region, you know, transmission lines are very old and no one invests in, in refurbishing them, no one, is investing in, in creating more or with more capacity in compare with the huge infrastructure of oil and gas that we have cr all cross border, uh, especially in the border with Texas. So at the end of the day, this paper shows that states, uh, both sides of the border, develop their own energy policies and climate policies for in, in, a, in a separated way policies for their own consumption, for energy consumption, including renewables. Texas is one, one example with huge renewable deployment for, for their own consumption. And the other, the other uh, alternative um, scenario is that uh, they develop their, their energy policies depending on cross-border trade profits. Texas will not stop selling oil and gas to Mexico because it's very profitable. So while Texas is trying to make this decarbonization come real. All, their, all, all the oil and gas is being sold to Mexico. And we are very happy here to, to receive all those, in, in all those resources. And to wrap up, you know, in, in the paper, because I've been talking a lot, um, I uh, show three cases in uh, three cross-border energy hubs. The, the California by California one, the El Paso electric with some Northern states in Mexico and the Texas, uh, Texas Mexico um, energy hubs. And the findings is that um, uh, only the California by California includes renewable electricity trade, uh, although in, a, in an asymmetrical way, but the others, you know, the El Paso electric and uh, Texas, the ERCOT, they just uh, profit from and depend on the, the demand coming from Mexico in terms of electricity trade regarding renewables. And I will stop here. So if you have any questions, you know, there's the, the, the paper, so we can discuss it later. Thank you. Thanks, Marcella. Uh, and thanks to both of the speakers for right, keeping your remarks on a complicated topic, suitably brief. I know that's not easy. So Josh, we'll go ahead and have you give your five minute Overview uh, great. Of your analysis, and then we'll get into some of the discussion. So, thank you so much, Lee, and uh, thank you to uh, Monica and Marcella, uh, whose papers are just excellent. Um, and thank you to Barry, who's been a fantastic mentor for me at the Ford School. Uh, so, my paper, which is co authored with a, a research assistant who at the time was a law student at Michigan, has now moved on uh, to a PhD in Europe, um, is was inspired initially by events that some of you may have been following in the state of Maine. And that is that a new transmission line that was constructed by Central Maine Power, which is the main regulated subsidiary utility of the energy giant Avant Grid, was uh, to bring carbon-free hydroelectricity generated in abundance in Quebec, uh, the Canadian province of Quebec, through the state of Maine to be consumed primarily by electricity customers in Massachusetts. And this generated enormous political controversy and ultimately resulted in a referendum question on last fall's statewide ballot in which Maine voters by overwhelming margins rejected the project, halting it from moving forward. And the future of that project is currently being litigated in the courts over in Maine. 
So the question is, why does this matter beyond Maine and Quebec, the source of the proposed electricity transmission and Massachusetts, its destination? Well, it matters because it highlights a simple but often forgotten truth that electricity knows no political borders. Electrons flow freely over the US and Canada border and to a lesser extent, but one that Marcella highlighted, the US-Mexico border every single day. And it matters because both the United States and Canada, which are the two countries I'll focus on, have committed to deep decarbonization of the electricity sector. And beyond that, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across their entire economies, the linchpin of the strategy of both countries is to electrify everything. Right, electrify transportation through electric vehicles, electrify home and building heating through heat pumps and things like that. So, of course, this is wonderful from, I mean, this is a good strategy. I have no qualms with the strategy, but of course this is gonna increase demand significantly on electricity. And when we increase that demand, it's very important that that demand be met with zero emission or low emission resources. Uh, now, the problem, uh, and this is something that uh, has been alluded to in this talk, in this uh, session, is that if we think about the most efficient way to do this, it becomes clear that we are going to need to build out enormous amounts of new transmission capacity, exactly like what had been proposed in Maine, but we're going to have to be doing that everywhere across the continent, both east to west and north to south. And in particular, <clears throat> it, it's noteworthy that Canada already produces most of its electricity from zero carbon sources and specifically from hydro. In fact, over two thirds of that country's overall electricity generation comes from hydroelectricity, whereas only 6% of our total generation here in the US comes from this resource. Now, it's important that we encourage both the US and Canada, but especially the US, given how far behind it is, to develop new sources of renewable generation as quickly as possible. And wind and solar are very important uh, pieces of this and um, they are rapidly being deployed in both countries. But I'd argue it's equally if not more important that we ensure that our cross-border transmission capacity is robust enough to ensure that existing renewable generation is distributed in the most efficient way possible especially when existing generation like uh, uh, hydro is what's known as firm and dispatchable rather than wind and solar, which are intermittent and require storage solutions. Now those storage solutions are being rapidly developed and scaled, but we have a long way to go if we're really gonna power the entire grid with large amounts of wind and solar. At the same time, we have this odd reality in both countries that many of the policies governing the electricity sector have been set forward at the subnational level. And here I'm talking about the provinces in Canada and the states in the US. Now, the bulk of my research these days is looking at the political forces that are shaping variation in the design of US state level renewable portfolio policies, which are, uh, have been the primary driver in the US um, of new renewable energy. And these policies are developed by state level politicians, some of them policy entrepreneurs, as Barry Rabe has written about, that have done tremendously good work, but ultimately the constituencies that they're serving are their own states. They want local economic development, they want benefits uh, for their own states. Nothing wrong with that. But again, because electricity doesn't care about state borders and they don't and it doesn't care even about national borders, what ends up happening is these policies are often at cross purposes with the goal of establishing new transmission, which again is essential to decarbonizing the continent's electricity sector. So uh, just to wrap up what um, Maka and I did in this paper was to look closely at the RPS policies of seven northeastern states. Those would be the six New England states plus New York. And we chose those states because they have the greatest degree of current interconnection with the Canadian grid, but also the greatest potential to expand that interconnection, which is uh, what was attempting to be happening in Maine. And here's where things get really wonky and into the weeds. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate this all on, in Q&A, but basically there's three elements. Uh, RPS policies, everyone knows them in terms of their, their targets and their timelines, how much renewable energy and by what time. And that, you know, those are great. Uh, they make for great bumper stickers and, and they're very important, those goals. But um, the policies themselves are extremely complicated and three provisions in particular 
One about resource eligibility, which resources count for credit under the renewable portfolio standard. A second is these renewable energy credits, which is the currency through which compliance with renewable portfolio standards is calculated. These renewable energy credits can to varying degrees in different states be unbundled from the electricity, which means that they're traded separately from the underlying electricity, which again, perfectly fine if the goal is to create new generation, but doesn't solve the problem if that generation has no transmission capacity to hook up from because the RPSs are basically certificates. They don't actually represent the, I mean, they represent energy, but they aren't actually the same as energy and therefore create barriers to transmission. So what we found when we considered, uh, oh, and then the third one, the third policy element is geographic restrictions on both generation and deliverability. And what we found when we looked at these three elements in the seven states is um, that they all were lacking. They're, they all you know, were, had significant room to uh, incentivize uh, cross-border transmission. New York's um, is the most encouraging of the seven. And uh, I have various ideas for why that is. And I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Um, Connecticut and Vermont are sort of in the middle. They've got some provisions that encourage this sort of cross-border transmission, but others that discourage. And the rest of the states uh, are severely uh, discouraging this transmission with the exception of Massachusetts, which is sort of in a category of its own because it subsequently passed its own separate legislation to try to deal with um, hydroelectricity. But the actual RPS um, uh, is fairly discouraging. So I think the main takeaway that I'll conclude with is that one of the keys to realizing the clean energy aspirations and specifically the clean electricity aspirations that both countries have stated at their national level is to expand transmission capacity. And we're still, uh, until we do that, we are still gonna become reliant, we're still gonna be reliant on traditional sources of electricity like gas and coal uh, if we don't have the transmission infrastructure to bring new renewables into the grid. And so this is a real opportunity for international continental coordination and collaboration rather than a continuation of the fairly siloed ways in which these policies have developed in one state or another, which again, I do not want to, um, I, am not an, I am not against these policies. They've done a tremendous amount of good um, in terms of uh, creating new domestic demand and sources for renewable energy, but the simple reality is that they were not designed with this question of transmission capacity in mind. And that is, I believe, the most urgent challenge going forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, so, although I have several questions um, for the panel, I think I'm really gonna limit myself to one for now. And I'm hoping that maybe each of you can talk a little bit about this because I really want to make sure that we have some time right for questions from the audience. So, so I'd say for uh, audience members, you can either put your question in the chat, right, or just use the raise your hand function, right, and I'll call on people as I see the hands go up um, after we get through this initial discussion as well. So I, I was really struck with all these papers, as I am by really almost any discussion of energy and climate policy today, about both places where um, what what gets talked about is environmental justice concerns really came up explicitly and and where they did not come up by name but i felt like they were really quite potentially relevant to the discussion um, so i'd really invite each of the panelists to just talk a little bit about um, are there ways in which for example i'll just give a couple of examples right so anytime you talk about international um, energy trade for example carbon offsets things like that you instantly engage a very robust, to say the least, right, debate about the ethics of um, exporting emissions, right, or co-pollutants, right, abroad, uh, or like I think Marcella's paper was fascinating in the context of California sort of basically taking, right, all the renewable energy from Mexico, right, in the one hub that's actually working, um, and, that, and that, that raises some important and confusing questions about, right, so how much is that really a benefit for Mexico? Is this just another form of sort of right, um, you know, version of carbon colonialism? And, and even between, I think, even with the Canadian US relationships, right? The when you talk about building new infrastructure, energy infrastructure, right, you almost automatically, you, it's not just, it's easy to dismiss the concerns as NIMBYism, but I think as both Monica and Josh talked about, right? But some of these concerns are quite serious, right? About um, 
indigenous land and other issues, right? And a lack of participation in that process or really challenging what forms of infrastructure, right, are appropriate where. So I guess I just really invite each of the panelists to talk a little bit about this, because it seems to me um, that the politic, energy politics today is just so tied up in these environmental justice um, issues that they, we really we all have to grapple with them anytime we want to talk about right any sort of major recommendations and we should need to talk about them right in that way so again i'd just be really eager to hear the panelists talk a little bit about how they see that connecting to their the proposals that they're discussing in their papers so if any of you want to take that first or sure i'll, I'll uh i can start uh lee and right. i'm sure josh and marcella both have thoughts as well yeah no i think this is really important and a lot of the work that that i've done in the energy and climate space has been about you know how do we move from the what to the how on emissions reductions and and looking at some of the you know areas where we haven't seen necessarily a lot a lot of a, a lot of attention whether it's intergovernmental relations you know, regulatory frameworks, energy security, as we're talking about today, uh, but also public opinion and, and community support uh, for projects. So if we just stick for a moment with uh, infrastructure, I mean, we've done tons of work around um, what informs uh, and shapes communities level of satisfaction with energy project decision making processes. And, and um, you know, while pipelines, of course, come to mind for people as the, um, you know, challenging sorts of infrastructure to, to site, as Josh has made clear with his paper, it's, it's just about any kind of large uh, major energy infrastructure project, regardless of what its benefits or impacts will be on the climate, you know, so, so one of the things that's come forward very clearly in our work is, is the, um, um, that at the local level, um, local environmental impacts will often trump, for lack of a better word, global climate benefits. Uh, and I think that's really important for us to, to be aware of. And in the Canadian context, in terms of Indigenous uh, rights and title, you know, increasingly, the starting point for Indigenous communities is not engagement. It's partnership and equity stakes uh, in, in projects. And so all of this I think, you know, back to the climate piece, all this actually takes time if you want to do it and do it well. And so I think we're we're going to see some real, you know, tensions there between uh, reducing emissions and ensuring that we are attending to those environmental justice considerations that that, uh, um, you know, that we all, I think, are very, uh, very alive to. The other just super quick uh, example I would give as well, and I was just on a panel this morning, actually, around greening Ontario's electricity grid, which already is like 92% non-emitting or something. So it's, it's quite an interesting discussion. But the question there is, you know, who pays what, when, and how for that process. And if it's landing on the shoulders of folks who are the least, you know, prepared to uh, pay for it, particularly as folks defect uh, from the grid, um, we've got some real problems from an environmental justice uh, perspective. So I see lots of intersections here, Lee, and you can always, you know, for purposes of my paper, you can always make the link back through to, to energy security, reliability, affordability of energy supplies. Thanks, Monica. Yeah. So Marcella or Josh, anything you want to add from your perspectives? Oh, Marcella, why don't you go first if you have? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, well, you know, in the case of the of the Mexico U.S. border, uh, two of the of the energy hubs we have, which is the El Paso Electric with and the ERCOT, the one in Texas, you know, the the things run like very like business as usual. We export crude oil and you and we import um, oils and gasolines and diesel and, and gas. So there's no, uh, you know, in terms of uh, justice, you know, it's like we do that because uh, the, the price that you offer is very, very low in comparison with the, the gas prices that we have in Mexico. So, and that makes, you know, affordable uh, access, that gives affordable access to to Mexico, Mexicans, you know, to, to, to get electricity and power. However, the, the interesting case, uh, Lee, is the Baja California, California hub, 
because um, as I mentioned, uh, energy in Mexico is centralized. However, Baja is so far away from, from the center that is not connected to the Mexican grid. It is connected to the California one. So for Baja, you know, in terms of justice and ethics and, and yes, of course, having all the externalities of green, of green in California, it doesn't matter really. It's, a, it's, it's, it's more of a, of a survival issue, you know, the, to get the supply necessary. And if it has to be with gas because it's cheap, right? Or if it has to be with oils and diesel coming from the United States, from California and other partners, well, it, let's let's do so, right? Because it's it's um, it's a matter of survival, empowering uh, all uh, all maquiladoras, all manufacturing in the north, um, and we we, we in Baja California we have electricity uh, generated by renewables. We have geothermal, and we have wind and solar, especially wind and geothermal. However, the companies, and this may be a, a topic for discussion later. The companies um, with the technology to do to generate that kind of electricity are from the United States. So, in in if we are very critical of the situation, we would say that um, Baja, it's uh, uh, it's manufacturing or maquila, right, of green electricity for California to meet climate goals. However, if we are a little bit more um, in the center of the discussion. We, we need to acknowledge that Baja needs California to power, you know, to, 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 live, to live in a normal daily life, to turn, turn on the lights every, every morning because it is not connected to the Mexican grid. So it has to be connected somewhere <laughs> to get the sources from somewhere and, and at affordable prices and gas is cheaper in, in, in that area. So um, yes, we can talk about inequalities. That's why in the paper I stress the asymmetrical relationship. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the, um, well, the, it is, an, uh, it is um, a, a mutual dependency. California needs renewables to meet its, its climate goals, and Baja needs whatever energy source they can, they can acquire. Thanks, Marcelo. So, Josh, maybe really quickly, because we are, right, I already have a, see a question in the yes, chat. Yes, yes. So. Um, so uh, basically, um, you know, a big part of the opposition in Maine was indigenous communities, but that was not the only part of the opposition. In fact, a lot of gas incumbent gas utilities were equally opposed to the transmission and it had nothing to do with environmental justice, but just that they didn't wanna to have to compete with the low price of hydroelectricity. That being said, environmental justice concerns are paramount when it comes to anything that involves other people's land. And that includes siting of renewable generation and of course, siting of these transmission projects. There is a growing body of researchers focusing on the former, the siting of generation. And I'd point to my University of Michigan colleague, Sarah Mills, who's done great work on this and Heather Millar as well, who will be involved in a later um, webinar. But um, when it comes to transmission, because they cross state and national borders, um, it's really a regulatory governance issue. And what we need is procedural just, what, what's known as procedural justice in the planning of new transmission. So we have to build the transmission. We can't just say that because you know, there's um, disadvantaged communities that that means that we can't ever build new transmission. What we have to do though, is make sure that their, their voice is equally, if not more present at the table as the various other constituencies and that they're compensated fairly for any land that is needed, so. Thanks, Josh. And I'll just, without expecting a response, add, I think it would be interesting for somebody to do an assessment of the co-pollutant impacts, right? Of shifting a lot of this production across the border of renewables, right? Because clearly you're leaving higher emissions of not just carbon, right, but other, and that's a big part of the debate over offsets. And I feel like that could be very relevant here. It sounds to me like it's already sort of coming up on the Mexican border, right? So that's just something, so the siting is a big question, but I feel like that would also be an interesting thing to think about as we think about these sort of international trade of electricity concerns. Okay, so. So I have a question in the chat from Martin Mostert, and then I see Deborah has a question. So maybe we'll just go in that order to start. Um, I can read Martin's question. Uh, so could you comment on electricity wastage because power is locked in 
For example, Ontario's nuclear power capacity being available at negative prices, uh, St. Catharines unable to sell hydropower off the Welland Canal, and the flip side, when electric cars become common, will there be a need to mandate or legislate plug-in at night when that excess power is available? And then the right speaker asks, how much greenhouse gas reduction is available just by reducing electricity waste, basically, and how can we accomplish that? So it sounds like that might be more of Monica's right valley, but- if Yeah, anybody... that, that's an awesome question, Martin, and, and I completely agree with the, the kind of the built-in premise there. I think- you know, job one uh, for some of these issues has to be about optimizing our existing systems. And there's no question that, that you know, as you've given a few examples here, that there's a lot uh, that can be done there. How does one go about incentivizing that? I think there, you know, and again, I'd, I'd have to look a little bit more closely at the specific situation in Ontario, but my, my spidey sense tells me um, that there, that you would need to ensure that we've got regulatory frameworks that are not only, you know, um, focusing on that traditional regulatory compact of cost of service regulation, but that are also increasingly incorporating considerations of emissions uh, reductions into, um, you know, into their decision making, because as, as it stands, um, there are limited capacities for utilities, whether it's on the gas side or on the electricity side, uh, to have, you know, their emissions reductions efforts either recognized compensated, taken into consideration in, in, uh, in decision making. And I think that's something that, you know, we've got a big gap there in terms of where policy ambitions are, and then where our regulatory systems are, are at. The second part of your question, though, I think it's also about, you know, optimizing our systems or aligning our systems for what's happening going, what's likely to happen going forward. So in Ontario, uh, for example, um, you know, the, the, you know, the current thinking is that uh, electrification will uh, lead to something like a doubling or maybe even a tripling uh, of Ontario's electricity generating uh, capacity. How much of that could potentially be uh, addressed through uh, reducing the waste, as you've noted here? How much of that could also be about, you know, as we have emerging systems that have distributed components to them, like electric vehicles, ensuring that we're optimizing that emerging uh, system? Because that itself can also reduce, as I think you're suggesting in your question, uh, can actually reduce the amount of new build that we actually uh, require and whether it's investment dollars for that or the challenges uh, of, uh, of getting things built, uh, um, you know, at the community level. Uh, let me just tack on one very small thing because Monica really covered that very, very well. <clears throat> um, just the, um, the latter part. So I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with um, what uh, Martin's referring to as electricity wastage. But, I, but in terms of the question about how much GHG reduction is available, the answer is not nearly enough. I mean, that, yes, Monica's 100% right. We need to focus on making the system more efficient. But um, first of all, nuclear is very low emitting when it comes to uh, GHGs. There's other problems with nuclear environmentally. But um, basically, we have to both build new capacity and make sure the existing capacity we have from hydro and from nuclear, which are both relatively low emitting, is distributed in the most efficient way possible. So uh, that's not instead of, but in addition to efficiency and optimization. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think Deborah, right, then Ninatan, uh, I think you had a question, right? So I'll go ahead and let you. Yeah. Hello, jump into the discussion. thanks. Yeah, thanks so much to the panelists for their, for their great papers. Um, so I think like a lot of people in this Zoom room, I have been so disillusioned by the um, lack of interest in cooperation across borders by the, the current Biden administration. <laughs> I had much higher expectations as I, I'm sure all of us did. And Monica, I completely agree. I find the renewed partnership agreement flaccid. I mean, it's just, there's, there's so little in there to hook anything on. And in fact, what I see in so many fields related to green energy, to EVs, you know, across some of these things where I think Canada and the US could be cooperating and the US and Mexico could be cooperating, um, I find actually a competitive dynamic emerging. And um, this is linked, I think, in really important ways to the very deep political polarization in the US and the deepening political uh, polarization in Canada. 
But, you know, it strikes me that maybe I'm wringing my hands about the wrong thing, because also lots of folks in this in this Zoom room, uh, including myself, have said the interesting stuff happening in certainly the, the Canada-U.S. Uh, relationship happens under the radar in transgovernmental interagency stuff, you know, sort of, you know, the, the kind of things that Monica was talking about with regulatory cooperation and, you know, ironing out some of that stuff. Can anyone give me some reason to hope that right now there are some interesting under the surface stuff happening that is furthering the cause of Canada US green energy interactions? Josh, why don't you jump in first? I had a well, I was just going to say, Deborah, that I'm hoping that you're going to give us the hope next week because uh, Deborah is one of the panelists uh, in the in our in our series, and uh, she's done a fantastic uh, paper um, on the uh, opportunities for cooperation. Um, but so I don't have anything more to say. I mean, unfortunately, I wish there was more optimism in my research. Uh, these days, it seems things like it seems like a, a vicious cycle of pessimism. But that's pretty much all I have to say. So Monica. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. That uh, you know, I I really want to give you something to you know cling on to there, Deborah, because I feel I I feel your pain, you know, and 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 it's at the subnational level too. I I don't quite understand, like what is going on? Why are we not? And I think you're right. The your analysis, I haven't looked at it closely enough to have a, a super considered view, but I think uh, you're you're on the right track. Where I would see some hope though is at the sort of um, industry uh, energy climate expert level, right? So this forum would be a nice illustration uh, of that. I see a lot of work being done, you know, across the border in terms of, of industry and really strong networks for the last 10 years or so. I've participated in a thing called the New England Canada uh, Business Council, their annual energy forum and it's bringing together you know i can remember josh i went out for dinner with the avon grid people and they were all really happy one year and then the next year nobody was there so um you know it, <laughs> there's definitely a lot going on at, at, at that level and i think it, it then you know sort of behooves hopefully uh either changes in the external environment things like rising energy prices for example things like growing climate um, you know, crises that that start to focus the mind on these issues and the recognition that there can be, you know, value to collaborating across the border. And then, you know, the folks like us and others kind of at the ready with uh, with suggestions for areas that we should be building on the on that collaboration. So I recognize that's not a super, you know, here are the five places I'd point to where lots is going on kind of an answer. But uh, uh, I think we have to we have to keep you know beating the drum for lack of a better expression. Looks like Deborah agrees. So yes, great. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have another question in the chat uh, from Sherry McWhorter, uh, speaking to Ukraine. So can uh, can you speak to the volatility of energy of the energy market because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And the subsequent calls to double down on fossil fuel infrastructure that's certainly been happening here in the us right uh those calls like pipelines as a matter of energy security is that what's needed here or given the escalating climate crisis is it more prudent to ramp up investment in renewable energy and transmission right given what's happening and why so if anybody wants to speak to that and i'll just say we probably will have time for like one more question after this question okay. so if you've got something you want to ask I'm assuming audience. that I'm assuming that's me who should probably answer answer that question. You know, from from my perspective, um, the 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 the. The debates we see emerging around this issue, I think, you know, are framing these as either or issues, just as the question has. And, and I think it's actually, it has to be and. It, you know, we have a, a global energy system and domestically as well here in, in both Canada and the US that is, you know, 80% uh, fossil fuel dependent. Turning that ship around is gonna take, uh, is gonna take some time. So even if you look at, you know, Europe's um, repower the EU uh, plan, 
it you know it sees um, reducing or sorry eliminating dependence on on Russian gas for example by uh, by 2030 you know and a good chunk of that happening in the next year or two and how are they going to go about doing that well on the one hand yes it's ramping up um, other sources of energy renewables on the other hand it is replacing that supply you know in the short medium long term uh, with uh, with uh, gas from other sources and I think you know what what pains me a bit about the current moment is that that rather than you know perhaps opening up a more constructive debate uh around these issues what we're seeing instead is is what deb pointed to a moment ago sort of more polarization uh around uh around energy and climate issues uh so my answer the short answer one word answer is is i think it's going to take both. I'm not sure about pipeline specifically, but certainly, uh, certainly the uh, um, contribution of countries like Canada and the U.S. and and others uh, in the Western Alliance to uh, strengthening energy security globally. Uh, and Marcella, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, sure. Yes, you know, building on Monica's comment, I would also add uh, new technologies. The the race for new technologies in energy. You know, knowing that China or even the United States are the, and France, of course, are developing, for example, micro nuclear plants, you know, and and some uh, micro batteries. Right. So I guess, you know, the the choice for Europe now, well, you know, the this horrible war may have an opportunity for Europe to decide at the end of the day who, what kind and who will supply energy. Because you know the the thing is the problem is, is Europe, right? Who's how, who who will be powering Europe if not Russia? So may maybe you know the the time for thinking thinking it twice for Europe to see if um, if Chinese uh, Chinese uh, supply or the United States or North American supply or others could substitute Russia or to or start uh, thinking of new technologies. Um, I know that they are still in development, but uh, for example, batteries and uh, saving energy, I guess it's already there. So I guess uh, this is more of an opportunity to rethink the, the, the path that Europe and then the path that the, the world would, would, would have in the next 50 years. Uh, so I agree with Monica that it's not an either or, it's a complementary um, discussion, but not about fossil fuels, but about renewables, which are maybe not, not sufficient, not enough, but new renewables plus other new technologies, hydrogen, uh, micronuclear especially. Okay, great question. Something that is on everybody's minds right now, quite a bit. Uh, all right, so it looks to me like maybe this is appropriate, right? We'll give Barry chance to ask the last question here. Uh, he wanted to follow up um, Deb's question uh, by asking something about the new North American trade agreement. And I was actually, that's great. I was I was also going to wanting to ask a question about carbon border adjustments. So we have great, great minds, think alike. Okay, so Barry, why don't you go ahead and give us the last question here on that. So. Well, disclosure, we did not coordinate this, Lee, but you know, the point that you raised, Deb, and really listening to each of the presentations has made me reflect on what has and has not happened in the North American space in the last couple of years. There's the US decision through electric vehicle subsidies to heavily favor, if it were to pass, American manufactured vehicles as opposed to those from our North American partners. There is, as we go into the second or third year of the new continental trade system, an international trade agreement, but one that largely dodged environment, climate, and energy issues, unlike digital relationships, unlike labor. But then we've got the bold new era of carbon border adjustments led by the European Union. But every time I hear a Canadian government official talk about this, it is kind of evasive, but yet well, there is this reality that Canada is moving toward a $170 Canadian per ton carbon pricing system. The US carbon pricing system is zero and is probably gonna remain at zero. And Mexican retains a very, very, very small carbon price that exempts natural gas. Does any of that influence or shape your thinking about the various sectors and arenas 
either opportunities in a CBAM or a more aggressive trade nexus world to think about some of the things that you'd like to see explored more in policy or any reaction to those to those particular ideas. And again, this is directly triggered by what Deb, you were talking about. And I have a sneaking suspicion we're gonna come back to this in a couple of weeks in later sessions. Thanks. If I'll just I'll just uh, really quickly comment on that that um you know given the sort of uh, problems that I talked about about the domain of electricity policy having up until now been primarily the province of subnational governments which of course have no say very little say compared to the federal government over trade policy I actually do see trade policy as a major potential vehicle for addressing some of these transmission issues because after all, electricity is what we're talking about being traded through these transmission lines. That said, I'm not a lawyer um, and I don't know some of the technicalities of um, you know, which area, which bodies of law would um, have jurisdiction. But I think Barry that um, the, trade, the trade climate nexus as you put it is fascinating. And um, you, know, you and others are gonna highlight a lot of potential there, but I think um, if to the extent that um, transmission could be addressed through trade, I think that would largely solve some of the problems that I was raising. And I would just super quickly add, because I know Lee, you're going to want to bring this to a close. I would just super quickly add, you know, yes is the, the short answer, but there's a lot of work, I think, Barry, that's going to need to be done. We've got all these different sort of systems emerging, right? So carbon border adjustment, uh, reforming, um, utility regulation, um, reforming electricity market design. Uh, how, how, you know, to what extent will these be or not be coordinated? And how much of, you know, what are some of the obstacles to that, that things like federalism, for example, might, uh, might pose? Um, I see those as huge issues on, on the not so distant horizon. And, and unfortunately, Barry, to your point, I would agree with you. I don't see a lot of kind of clear headed thinking on on any of those issues necessarily coming forward uh, on, on the Canadian uh, on the Canadian front. And Marcella, just, yes, just add a quick quickly. comment. Uh, sure. uh, Article eight of the USMCA is an is an exception that Mexico put to the energy sector. So I'm not that optimistic that trade, the federal, the federal trade in the three countries would go for a, a carbon adjustment, at least in the US-Mexico border, um, because well, Mexico is uh, exempted electricity and, and, and other energy sources and, and the sector into the, into, into the USMCA. Um, so I'm not that um, optimistic. For, for the Mexico US to, to change the, for the USMCA to change things in terms of energy and electricity. Okay. Well, I think that yeah, brings our panel to a close. So um, again, I'll just say thanks to all the panelists for uh, really thoughtful treatment of these complex and pressing issues. And I really recommend the papers, right? To everybody who's attending. Uh, I know this is the first of only a, a, several of these panels in this series, and so I, I was going to go ahead and let Josh just remind people when the next panel will be meeting, so you can make sure to get that onto your calendar. So, Josh, do you want to go ahead and do that? Great. Um, well, I just want to thank you, Lee, again, um, for not only for moderating this, but what a lot of folks in the audience may not know is that Lee actually helped review some of these papers in progress and made them better. Um, so I, I really am appreciative of, of you, uh, Lee. So yes, um, please join us for our next event, uh, which is going to be a week from Tuesday, which is April 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that will be um, Barry Rabe's paper on methane policy, uh, uh, as well as Trish Fisher focusing specifically on agricultural methane. And as we alluded to earlier, Deborah Van Nynenton um, and her um, uh, co-author um, explore these cooperation clusters. Um, that'll all be happening uh, on April 5th at 4 p.m. And um, to find out about these events, um, if when you registered for this one, you checked the box that said, keep me informed about the other ones, you'll hear from me directly about that. Otherwise, you can check the Ford School website uh, where that information update, where that event is already posted and you can register today if you wanted. So uh, thank you so much and uh, take care everybody and thanks yep. for joining us. Great, thank you so much.